Welcome to the Think Fitness Life Podcast, where we bring the mind, body, and gym together so you can improve your health, increase performance, and live your best life. For more information, visit thinkfitnesslife.com. Here are your hosts, Matt Gluckman and Eric Menchie. to introduce Paul Kolodzik, everybody. This was a very relevant podcast episode talking about the popular drugs, Ozembic, Wegovy, semi-glutide, these weight loss drugs that are being readily prescribed across the, the nation right now. They're known as GLP-1 medications, and Paul has been working with them since 2017. We talk about the pros and cons. We talk about how to use these drugs so that you can have long-lasting benefits without continuing to use the drug for your life. And we talk about continuous glucose monitoring, which he was the revolutionary doctor to use glucose monitors in a preventative fashion. And he wrote a book. So without further ado, Dr. Paul Kolodzik, everybody. All right. And we are live with Dr. Paul Kolodzik and discussing these new GLP-1 weight loss medications. You may know them as Ozembic. Semaglutides, Zepbound, Terzapatide. Correct. And there's, I think, two others I'm not going to try to pronounce. But I want to dive right in and I want to understand a little bit more about your background and how you got into the specific area you're in today. Yeah. So thanks. First of all, very happy to be here. My background's in emergency medicine. So 25 year emergency medicine career. And, you know, what gets all the press in, in regarding emergency departments is, you know, the gunshot wounds and the motor vehicle accidents, the multiple traumas, the overdoses, but really the bread and butter of emergency physicians is the things we see every day that are related primarily to vascular disease. Vascular disease means inflammation of your blood vessels. And a lot of that I found over the course of my career relates to high blood sugar. And we've got an epidemic of high blood sugar in this country. And so my goal after seeing, you know, the heart attacks and the strokes and the diabetic emergencies and the renal failure and the peripheral vascular disease was to start a practice out here in Ohio where I help patients recognize that they have insulin resistance and high blood sugar. And then we work together to lower that so they can avoid some of those bad outcomes of being diabetic. You know, I really focus on pre-diabetic patients and metabolic syndrome patients, Mm -hmm. patients that are overweight, large abdominal girth, hypertension, high cholesterol, because we want to kind of pull them back from the edge from uh, Mm -hmm. experiencing those more serious problems as they get older. Now, have you seen a trend, uh, like an increase in the rates of these um, diseases or Uh, emergency events just, you know, in the last 20, 30 years? Yeah. So, you you know, the backstory on all this is, and, you know, we talked a little bit beforehand, I'm a, I'm a low carb doc. So the things you'll, you'll hear from me that you won't hear from your standard doc is don't worry about your fat so much. And I don't really care about you being on the elliptical. I want to get you in the weight room. So, but, but the story is, is that the food pyramid came out in in the 1970s and we went from eating 25% carbs almost overnight to 50% carbs in our diet. We were told that was the way to go because we had to avoid fat. And what happened then was the epidemic of obesity took off Mm -hmm. on, you know, almost like clockwork, The, the food pyramid comes in. And then we have an obesity problem. And then 10 years later, as you would expect, we have a diabetic problem. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, there's been just kind of an exponential increase Increase. in these problems over the course of my career. You know, I think, you know, unfortunately, all the incentives, you know, financial incentives were with the pharmaceutical industry, with statins, with the food processing industry. You know, the government with the food pyramid, I think, just, you know, relied on bad science. And so we've been led down this road of, you know, increased carbs and low fat. And the result has not been been good. And I think when we're talking about low carb diets, 
and reducing insulin resistance and all that. We're just talking about going back to the way Americans have eaten for generations before we were told in the 70s to eat all these carbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, there absolutely is, you know, a agricultural pharmaceutical complex. But I think sometimes it gives a bad rap to pharmaceutical intervention. You know, everyone wants to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But if you look at like the three major step functions to longevity, one of them was antibiotics. So we can't just say, oh, be done with all things that I'm going to intake and just focus on lifestyle changes. It's got to be a a happy medium of both. And I love that that's what we're going to talk about today. So tell me a little bit about how these classifications of drugs specifically work in the body. Okay, so we're talking about the GLP-1 medications. The most popular ones out there now are, it started as Ozembic, Ozembic and Wagovi. Ozembic's for diabetics. Wagovi, you okay. can't get Ozembic unless you're diabetic. And Wagovi is for weight loss. They are the exact same medications, exactly the same medications. And then there is compounded generic medication because these medicines are so expensive out of pocket if you don't have coverage Mm -hmm. um, that is also available as well when we prescribe for some patients. The parallel medications are Monjuro, which is for diabetics. Just out in the last month or so, Zepbound, which is for weight loss. And the generic for that is Terzipatide. So the story of these medications is they were first used in diabetics and they were found to not only help control blood sugar, but also to help those diabetics lose weight. So the good thing about these medicines is they control blood sugar in a given range. They don't cause hypoglycemia. They don't cause really low blood sugar. And so the pharmaceutical companies saw this, that they controlled blood sugar, but they didn't cause hypoglycemia. And they, in their studies, found that their patients were losing uh, 12 to 15 percent of their body weight Mm -hmm. with these medications. So like any good drug company would do, they went back and did more studies and found an indication or an applicability for obesity. So these medications then came out primarily now with Govi and Zepbound for, for, for weight loss. And the criteria now for their use is having a body mass index of 30 or higher or having a body mass index of 27 with some kind of metabolic health problem like hypertension or high cholesterol or one of those issues so so that's kind of their history are they not going to look at percent body fat real versus yeah it's interesting i think you you know we all know the flaws of bmi and how larger muscle mass makes that an inaccurate reading but all the studies for the indications were done on BMI and, you know, it's easy to calculate. So I think that's why, that's why they went with it. Yeah, yeah. That's why they went with it because generally, you know, to get an accurate body fat percentage, which is of course a much better reading, you know, there's usually a little bit more involved electropedance study okay. or bod pod or something like that. Just adds to the cost essentially yeah. of the study. So, you know, for our listeners, you know, there's, there's really two ways people can, can lose fat. And if they, if they wanted to remove fat cells, that would be liposuction. But predominantly, we try to, to make our fat cells smaller. So when we have extra sugars in our bloodstream and our body can't process them out, they'll get shoveled and stored into fat cells for later. So does Ozembic and this other drug, Wegovi, does it just basically... Keep, help metabolize that sugar in the bloodstream into ATP. So it's, it's just constantly burning. Yeah. It, it actually helps you because of your decreased oral intake, you're taking in less carbs. So there's less blood sugar there to begin with. Gotcha. So this, these drugs have three mechanisms of action. The first one is just what you mentioned. It, you, you lower blood sugar. And I, I'm going to digress here a little bit for a second, because gotcha. you know, you, when you lower blood sugar, then that means your body, organs are seeking an alternative source of energy and that's fat and the fat gets burned if it's done in an accelerated rate that creates ketones that's where the word keto diet came from but basically you're lowering blood sugar and and burning more fat that's the first mechanism of action okay the second is that uh these drugs slow gastric emptying that's a fancy way of saying food stays in your stomach for a longer period of time So you uh, don't want to eat as much and you don't want to eat again as quickly. 
And then the third effect is there's a direct effect on the hypothalamus in the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that is the hunger center. And so that's the three mechanisms of actions of these medications. So it helps regulate ghrelin or leptin or... or, or... It, it, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it, that's exactly what GLP stands for. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a famous comic where there's a, there's two lines at a doctor's office and, and no one's in line on the right. And it says diet and exercise advice. And the other one just says like medication and everyone's in line there. Right. And you know, it's, it's hard to just take a hammer and beat everybody like, Oh, it's just diet and exercise. It's just diet and exercise. Yeah. There's definitely a happy medium, but tell me, talk to us some about, talk to us more about the cases where these classifications of drugs are, are needed. Or, right. or just preferred yeah so so you, you know you're right the truth is usually somewhere in the middle you know you can look at only diet and exercise and you could look at only medications and i built my practice over the last five years on, on really a standard program related to diet and exercise and for me that's low carb diet intermittent fasting and strength training because strength training helps with insulin resistance and lower your blood sugar in your system as your increased muscle size soaks up more of that insulin and more of that blood glucose. It promotes, um, it promotes maintaining lean muscle mass, which will also keep your metabolism working better. Right. Yeah. So I, I really push uh, my patients. My typical patient is kind of a metabolic syndrome patient, you know, usually middle-aged and I, I really push those patients towards strength training. I don't entirely ignore the cardiovascular approach. You, you know, they got to do minimal cardiovascular training, but you know, if they're working out five hours a week, I'd like to see them do an hour of cardio altogether, maybe yeah. three 25 minute sessions, and then re really focus the rest on strength training. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there, I'm sure there's plenty of people who have metabolic dysregulation, hormonal dysregulation do you identify that through blood work to understand whether they're a good candidate for a glp1 yeah, yeah so yeah a absolutely but but again we, we start so we, and we'll come back to this but yeah it, you know when people come and they're seeking this medication you know i i think it's incumbent on the doc they're working with the medical provider they're working with not to say okay here's your medicine and you're going to be on it for the rest of your life Right. Because there's no question there's weight regain if you go off when you go off the medicine, if you have not made the lifestyle changes that are important. And the other thing is when you're losing weight on these medications, you're also losing muscle mass. So a comprehensive program with those components that we talked about, I feel is very important. So th the way I evaluate patients is I, I do two things that are very important. We do standard lab panels. But I think there are two diagnostic elements that are critical. One is I'm a big continuous glucose monitor person. Mm. So CGMs are those devices that you see on the back of diabetics arms and they mm. measure blood glucose 24 seven. And I have patients come in and I put a CGM on the back of their arm and I say, don't change your diet. Let's kind of see where you live in terms of what's going on with your blood sugar. So this is, a little bit of a non-standard use because I use the CGMs in pre-diabetics and non-diabetics. But actually, once we put a CGM on some people's arms, they find out they're pre-diabetic for the first time. Or yeah, they're actually right. I have patients that come in and they're they're spiking with their CGM sometimes to 220, almost a diabetic range. So that's a very teachable moment with a yeah. continuous glucose monitor, because even if their doc has been talking to them for years about your blood sugar is a little bit high, you got to watch your diet. When they see those numbers on the, on the graph, on the app at their phone, the way some of my patients have put it is you can't unsee that. Right. You now understand what's going on with the blood sugar in your body. Yeah. So the CGMs are great. So important that I wrote the book about it, which I'll plug a little bit later. Please um, do. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second component, I don't know if you've talked a lot about this on your show is a fasting insulin level. Have no, we have that? not. No, we have okay. not. Yeah. So I believe a fasting insulin level for the majority of middle-aged overweight Americans is more important than your cholesterol than your, level. 
Interesting. Okay. Yeah, because I believe that 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 high blood sugar in your system, resulting from insulin resistance, is more important to focus on than necessarily a cholesterol at two forty. You know, cholesterols anymore. Quite honestly, if you don't, you know, I don't want to get too wonky on you, but if you don't do the subfractions of cholesterol and entirely, you know, know what your LDL is made of, the big particles or the little particles, or the little particles, yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily mean a lot. Yeah. And, but but for people that have high blood sugar, anytime your blood sugar, the the, par, the party line in medicine is if you're over, your blood sugar is over 140, there's like some kind of vascular inflammation going on, which means, you, you know, that glucose is attaching to the lining of your blood vessels. As yeah. an aside, it also attaches to your cartilage and causes joint inflammation. But that that glucose is a big deal, and I think a bigger deal than cholesterol for most people. So we do a fasting yes, insulin, insulin level. level. So the physiology is real quickly here is that when you eat a carb, your blood sugar goes up. And when that happens, insulin gets released from the pancreas because it drives that blood sugar into your organs, let's say your muscles. Mm -hmm. And what you want then to do is have a, a moderate amount of insulin control your blood sugar. If your insulin's going way up and your blood sugar's not controlled, then that means you got insulin resistance. Basically, mm -hmm. those organs are saying, insulin, we are not going to listen to you anymore. There's plenty of blood sugar around here. We, you've been eating carbs for a long period of time. Your blood sugar has been high. There's plenty of glycogen, complex glucose molecules stored, stored in your muscles. And so your muscles then resistant resist that insulin and what happens then that high blood sugar goes to the liver gets converted to fat causes fatty liver disease just as you mentioned gets deposited around the middle so we, we really want a process that reverses that which is again low carb intermittent fasting and strength training so diagnostically that's what i focus on a period of a cgm trial and then a fasting, the fasting insulin, insulin level. level. Yeah, which I, I and I think those are critical, critical tests. I think people should be walking into their doc's offices asking for a fasting insulin level. And now is that that won't be under standard blood work, is it? You have it's, to ask for it specifically. It's very rarely done. The only people I generally see doing it are OBGYN doctors for patients that have a condition called polycystic ovary disease. So it's rare, it, it's rarely done. I think it should be started at, part of the standard panel for, lab for work. obesity. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. In, in 15 or 20 years it will be, but you know, things change very slowly in medicine. For sure. For sure. So tell us a little bit about how someone should be appropriately using these drugs. Maybe you have an example of a horror story, an example of a, a, a brilliant success story. Yeah. So the way these medications should be used prudently is prudently and, and and you know the genie is out of the bottle on these medications you, you know people in general are are going to seek the medicate these medications you know yeah. it you know it's probably the closest thing quote to a magic pill that that you, you know we're going to see and i think these medications for good or bad are going to become the most prescribed medications in the history of the world i think previously it has been the statins I think the GLP-1 medications will overtake that eventually. But the considerations are what I mentioned previously. If, if somebody wants to use this medication to help improve their metabolic health or to lose weight, then they got to stop and think about whether they want to be on this medication for the rest of their life when they're going to approach this. Because there are plenty of internet providers, plenty of docs out there that will just throw medicine at people, say, good luck, you, you know, you'll lose weight on it and, and you will. But the way I use them is to get people through a stall or to get them a boost as they're starting the use of the medications. And I use them in low doses. And then I try to use them for limited period of time measured in months, not years. Okay. Uh, because I don't want to commit them to a lifetime of medicine without the lifestyle change. You know, if they're making the lifestyle changes, then they'll be able to titrate down and off the medication. Right. Uh, but right. if you're doing nothing but but taking the medicine, then, you know, there's not a physical dependence, but there's a psychological dependence because you're going to regain weight when you go off it. And then there's the muscle mass piece. You, you've got to be, I don't think anybody, any 
medical providers should be prescribing this medication unless they're giving focused attention to the fact that the patient's doing strength training and getting adequate protein because you're going to have muscle mass wasting you know we're, we're losing seven percent of our muscle mass every day as we age right yeah right. and for women men too but for women too there's the risk of osteoporosis which directly relates to the amount of muscle mass you have so you know these medicines i think need to be used in the context of the comprehensive program have we seen you know published studies for people who have taken these drugs for over years yeah so the, the medications first when they came out as as you know treatment for diabetes they have been you, you know studied and used regularly some of the early ones over 10 to 12 years the ozembic the newer medicines are really just out in the last five years or so so okay. there's always that question of you, you know with 15 or 20 years of use are there going to be unusual problems developed so you know i mean if the medication has an appropriate indication and you're using it prudently i i think that's appropriate but yeah all the data is not in on how this right. might affect people 20 or 30 years down the road how long typically should someone be on these drugs i mean because is it, is it it's something called like a drug holiday where you take a drug and your body kind of gets its idea of what it needs to be doing and then you come off the drug and it, it keeps going yeah yeah so that that's a great concept now you, you know and and again i got to be careful not to be too disparaging with the drug companies but you know their view is obesity is a chronic disease and requires a chronic treatment which means forever forever right um, but but these are medicines just to get in a little bit of specifics how they're given is they're given as weekly injectables and the dose is titrated up over a period of time so you might start for example with Wagovia at 0.25 milligrams and after a week move up the next excuse me after a month for four injections over a month then you move up to 0.5 milligrams etc one of the reasons for that is because they do cause some side effects nausea um, is the primary one I see and again that's why you should be working with a provider who knows what they're doing because they can you, you know titrate these medicines differently depending upon your individual needs side effects along yeah, the way minimum, and, and i do that for patients all the time you know oh you're yeah. having some persistent nausea let's not move up in dose maybe we'll move down in dose um yeah. but but the goal is to you know titrate them up to a moderate range and i never use the maximal dosages for the reasons we talked about because um since you're out in utah i always use the stephen covey phrase the highly the, the seven habits of highly effective people um, I think that's where he's from. And one of his phrases was begin with the end in mind. And the end in mind here is that you're going to eventually get off these medications. And yeah. so we want to titrate it up slowly. We want to not use maximal doses. We want to titrate it down. So that is best done, I think, in a period of months. You really don't you, you want to avoid getting into a situation with, where, it, you know, you're committed to these medications for years. Right, right. Because then you're just going to increase your risk of, of negative side effects further down the road. And, there and, and dependency. I'm sorry. And, and and just dependency in general, right? Anytime right. we support a system, we're, yeah. we're essentially weakening it. Right. I, I, exactly right. And that's why you got to be doing the other things that we've talked about. You know, yeah. and there are some serious side effects. Um, you, you know, the most common serious side effect is a problem called pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas. And I actually, I've been fortunate because I use low doses. I probably haven't seen as much of it, but I, ha I have had one patient, a young patient that developed pancreatitis. So, yeah. it, it, you know, they, they aren't entirely benign. There can be problems. Usually when patients have side effects, we kind of work through that. So again, in general, I think they're, they're good medicines if used prudent. Yeah, and I want to talk more about your methodology and your book here in a second, but I also want to just highlight the abuse that we're already seeing with this drug. Like I've even seen it at my gym where people who were already in phenomenal shape, you know, you, you see it, they come in, you see them a week later and they are, you know, skin and bones. And, you know, they're, they're predominantly for, like you said, people with diabetes or people who are obese based on their BMI. Right. But I feel like we're seeing a lot of adding, adding to like an unhealthy level of, of body image disorder, yes. of, of anorexia, bulimia, because there's people who are already 
adequately fit they have a standard bmi or or even lower yeah and they're taking these drugs to just like shrink down right yeah they shouldn't you know i mean they shouldn't be prescribed first of all you should meet those criteria yeah. you know of the the bmis and then the other thing is is that you need to be titrating down and off the medicine when you hit that bmi at 25 you know so but how and, do we as as professionals try to mitigate that risk you know it's like it's it's just one of those things where it's like you know people like add right you know medication came out and you, you see these kids doing great in class and you, you just feel like well if i don't take it too then i'm gonna fall back compared to the the bell curve of the rest of the class right and the body dysmorphia thing is i mean i've had patients they get to a bmi and you know they they of 25 and they want to be a bmi of 22. And I've yeah. had patients that have come to me set w- with a BMI of 25 and they want to get to a BMI of, you know, 18. And, and it's, it, you know, it, it's really incumbent on the medical providers. Right. It, it's the it's the person prescribing the medicine's responsibility to, yeah. to basically work with that patient and say, no, that's not right. And, and in a nice way, I, I'm not going to do that. Do you think we'll see FDA intervening and and extra adding extra regulations? Yeah, I I mean, I I think the regulations that they have there are reasonable now with the criteria. The one thing I've been able to find, though, I must say, is there's a criteria for getting on the medication. I haven't been able to find a BMI, and maybe it's just me that hasn't been able to find it, where it says, oh, at this point, you should withdraw. Get off the, yeah, Yeah, right. And, right. and I haven't been able to find that. So I think that's left, left to provider discretion. Mm-hmm. It, you know, for me, though, it's when you get to a normal BMI at 25. Yeah, we have time to titrate down and get yeah. off the medication. Yeah. So tell us more about your book. Okay. Well, so I, I really think that the continuous glucose monitors can be life-changing for people when they see those graphs. And you know, again, originally created and prescribed for diabetics to help monitor the amount of insulin they're supposed to inject. But I think they they have great utility in yeah. patients that are non-diabetic and pre-diabetic, again, because it's a teachable moment. So again, I use these CGMs for two weeks diagnostically, people can see their data, and then I use them therapeutically to help guide low-carb diets for a period of time after that so i was just you know i i felt you know the last chapter in the book is cgms change lives and i really believe that because i have patients that once they see that data it it impacts them and it helps them follow their diet and you know and i don't know what your thoughts are on this but i believe you know a low carb diet is sustainable for a lifetime a calories in calories out diet really not so much and cgms they put guide rails on that so i I wrote the book, The Continuous Glucose Monitor Revolution for Non-Diabetics, and it's really just a, a, a pragmatic Bible for people that want to use a CGM to improve their health. So it's available on Amazon, uh, and you know it's the best-selling book on CGMs on Amazon, and it, it's been fun doing it. First time I wrote a book, and you know it's been a great experience. Yeah, I think it speaks to, I think, the best part of medicine and healthcare, which is preventative care and being proactive. And to your point, it's like they're using CGMs only when people already had diabetes, but yeah. what a great tool to use to kind of beat it to the punch and, and help intervene in people's health before it gets to a point where it's too late to, to correct something. Yeah. And, and to that point, I would like to make, you know, your audience aware of the issue of prediabetes. I don't think we take prediabetes serious enough in this country. If your doctor says oh, your blood sugar is a little bit high, we'll keep an eye on it. Then then you need to be you need to realize that means you're either prediabetic or heading to prediabetes. Prediabetes is reversible in the vast majority of people. And then you can prevent progressing to diabetes and, you know, be at risk for all those vascular complications that that we talked about. So, you you know, we opened with me talking about my emergency medicine career and, and, you you know, trying to move from being reactive to these problems that have already impacted people's lives, the heart attacks and the strokes, et cetera, to being proactive in terms of trying to prevent those problems. And 
CGMs are probably the most valuable tool to help us do that. Yeah, and and kind of back to one of your questions with with the low carb diet sustainability then versus calories in calories out. I a hundred percent agree. I mean, if you look at the evidence out there, blue zones, people that are already living to a hundred in highly densely populated areas, they're predominantly eating a, a Mediterranean diet, which is low carb, higher fats, higher protein, yeah. predominantly plant-based. And when you can kind of have a, a general scaffolding like that versus a calories in calories out type of approach, you mitigate the hypervigilant side around food, which I've seen be a, a negative contributor to someone trying to lose weight is they, they basically are spiking their cortisol levels every time they have to make a food choice and it becomes counterintuitive. So I think when you can, and, and it's so hard if you're, if you're trying to look through a keyhole and create this whole image, but the, having a continuous monitor, like you said, it's, it's something you just can't not see. It's, it's evidential real time feedback that you're getting based upon your habits and behavior. Yeah. I mean, people see, you know, people eat a piece of pizza and it's not like I want to destroy the enjoyment of pizza for people for the rest of their lives. Right. But, but, you know, once they see that, they know what that pizza is going to do and it modifies behavior. The other thing yeah. that's great about low carb, I believe versus calories in calories out is, and I tell my patients all that this all the time is you can always eat something. You, you know, you, you can always eat something. You might not be able to eat something with a lot of carbs, right. um, but you can always eat something on a low carb diet. Yeah. 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 Excellent. So where can people find you? Okay. You already said where people can find your book is on Amazon, but where can people find out more about you and your work? Okay. So my metabolic health practice um, is available to patients in Ohio, Indiana, Florida, and Arizona. You know, since COVID, we've been seeing people primarily via telemedicine. It's really a great approach for this type of practice because it is a less hands-on, less physical exam type practice. We're mostly looking at data and modifying plans, et cetera. Yeah. So, you know, we, we basically have people get their lab work done, you know, in their locale, uh, call in the CGMs to their local pharmacies. If we do use the medicines, we can call those into the local pharmacies as well. So I'm at metabolicmds.com. So metabolicmds.com is the website. And then, you know, at Dr. Colo on Twitter and at Dr. Colo on, on TikTok. And we're also, I'm also on LinkedIn and Instagram. So you can find us then. And, uh, you know, again, we're, we're uh, a growing practice. I got a physician assistant and a nurse practitioner working with me and we're welcoming patients from those four states, Ohio, Indiana, Florida, and Arizona. Excellent. Excellent. I'll be sure to include those links in uh, the show notes for okay. those that are listening. Last thing I like to ask everybody is what's your favorite exercise or lift? So I, I, I got to tell you, so this is influenced by emergent, my emergency department career as well. And, and it is that, you, you know, the most important for, thing for people as they age is mobility. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I mean, I, I, we, I take care of people and it's, it's not like they got a joint problem or a neurological problem. It's just, you, you know, a lot of, some of them will have a big belly and just not enough muscle mass in their legs. So yeah. it comes back to the don't skip leg days. And, you, you know, <laughs> I don't think there's a better exercise than squats. As you get older, you know, you got to maybe not do as heavy a weight. You know, you got to be careful that you aren't, you know, causing any problems with your back. But yeah. in terms of just making sure you got that range of motion and making sure you're building muscle mass in your legs, you, you, you got to do squats. I'll be honest, honest with you. I, I have a tendency to do legs you know, I mean, I'll do some leg exercise two or three times a week just because I yeah. believe in this mobility and leg strength uh, concept so much. I mean, yeah, everybody wants to have these and, you know, a big <laughs> chest, yeah. but, you know, don't, you know, don't skip leg day. In fact, do leg, leg day a couple times a week. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm right on board with you, too. I, I squat on on one day and on a second day, I, I deadlift and do some more hamstring work. And then my final day, I, I do upper body work, but then I'm always adding in, you know, single leg work, accessory work on that day. So I'm doing yeah. three days of, of leg work as well. So I'm glad yeah. you said that. Last question is, 
What's your favorite quote if one comes to mind? You know what? I think I already mentioned it. Begin with the end in mind. Know where you're going. Have a plan. You know, just don't move forward blindly. You know, I read that book 25 years ago and that stuck with me. So Love I'll it. go with begin with the end in mind. Love it. Dr. Paul, Paul Kolodzik, everybody. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot, man. If you're ready to make steps towards improving your health or increasing your performance, book a free 30-minute call today by visiting thinkfitnesslife.com.